Welcome to a solitaire board game review from the playersaid.com. My name is Grant. Uh, today I'm shooting this video review and I'm not going to do a playthrough. Uh, only because the year is winding down. 2023 is over. I've got so many 2024 games that I want to get tabled. Um, there are plenty of other playthroughs out there. Wayne Hansen does a good job and some others. But I, I wanted to give you my thoughts on this uh, newest game from Ben Madison called Global War, World War II Worldwide, 1939 to 1945. And it is a solitaire only game. It is a States of Siege series game, but not in the traditional manner. And what I mean by that, and if you've watched many of my videos, this game, like Kaiserkrieg, which was a couple of years ago, and it was World War I States of Siege. It doesn't use a traditional, I'm going to go ahead and move the box. It doesn't use a traditional five or six tracks that converge on a central point. You know, in this case, um, that might have been, say, Germany. But it doesn't do that. It does more of a horizontal structure. And what I mean by that and I've tried to think through how to explain this, is you'll see these different fronts. You've got A, B, C. That's the Western European theater, the Eastern front. And then here is the Mediterranean and Italy. Then over here in the Pacific, because remember this is uh, global worldwide, you've got the C China India theater, CBI, basically. You've got the Southeast Asian Theater. I'm sorry, this is China. This is more CBI. Um, and then you've got the traditional South Pacific Theater out into uh, the area near Indonesia. Hawaii's up here, midway shown on the board. Um, and what happens is, and you'll notice, and this game is on, I think I'm on turn four. Yeah, turn four, and this is my fourth play of the game, I think. And I, I decided that I had learned enough lessons and had formulated my thoughts that I wanted to share those with you. But rather than the converging tracks, what it has is these various fronts and these units you'll notice in these Japanese theaters out uh, in the Pacific, they are building up and they've got several units. Now, over here, I'm going to move my camera really quickly, and I will move it back. I don't like to do this normally. This is what is called the counter tray, and it is literally a piece of paper that identifies where all the different counters go, the different units, the different event shits, um, your strategy tokens, uh, which you have to acquire these to ultimately defeat these various fronts and shut them down. Similar to other States of Siege series games, you can knock a theater out of the war. But up at the top, as I'm explaining these, this horizontal structure, you'll notice that, and I'm gonna move these units down a little bit so that you can better see that. You can see the numbers here, uh, I'm sorry, the letters printed, A, B, C, D, E, and F. Those coincide with these fronts. And these units are going to come onto the board when you draw one of these chits. And the game is chit pull. It doesn't use cards. That is one of the innovations that I've really enjoyed from Ben Madison. Several of his games now uh, uses this chit pull mechanic. But when you pull those chit pull mechanics, and for instance, here on the bottom left, that says three attacks on the A front. So you're going to go over here on the A front. And they're going to do three, the Axis powers are going to do three attacks against the Western European Theater or France. And what's going to happen is if you don't have defending units there, you're simply going to move uh, these units into, sorry, I've got them kind of all mixed up. I didn't put them back right. But you're going to move these units into this theater for each attack, unless you've got defending units. And in this instance, you do not. But you're going to move those on over onto the board. You can see that. And then I'm going to come back to the main board because you, you've seen where I've put a couple of those German units. Anytime that there are more units than the allowed limit there, they're going to do what's called a blitz. 
So once, sorry, once all of these available units, not the uh, atomic bomb symbol there, but here on that Western theater, <coughs> there are a total of five units. And once those fifth one get out, get out there and there's another attack, you're going to place a blitz marker. And then basically the next attack is going to demoralize one of your various cities. And I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and show you, uh, this is a city and you start with, I think 13, two, four, six, eight, nine, 10, 11. You start with 11. And some of these are Soviet ones, which can only be demoralized later in the game. But you're going to, if they attack and have extra attacks, you're going to have to choose and move a city over to the low morale area. So ultimately, if you ever get all of those over, or if you're ever asked to do a basically a morale check, you're going to have to roll 2d6. And if you roll under the amount of those cities that you've got in there you're going to you're going to automatically lose the game that's one of the ways that you can uh, lose the game so allowing these fronts to build up with five and six units then are going to lead to a blitz attack lowering morale of your cities and you're going to have to fight like hell to get these units off the board back into that reserve box so that you can withstand future attacks. Because if you don't do that, you're literally just going to get obliterated. Um, so that's that's how the horizontal states of siege kind of makeup is very different. Remember the tracks on the other SOS series games, you're going to move a unit down as it moves. If it ever gets into the center, you're going to be defeated. So in this game, it's different. I like it. It's unique. It's interesting. He did this in Kaiser Krieg. Now he's forwarded it on into Global War. I can't wait to see what he's going to do uh, next with this system, what game he's going to tackle. But that that's what the, the, the basic game is, States of Siri, uh, Siege series. You're going to go through a total of 27 turns. So this is a very, very long game. And there are 27 chits that are in this cup. Actually, there's not 27. There's a few less than that because these three green chits up here at the top, these are your starting. You randomize these and you start with them um, by laying them out like that. And those are going to be your first three scripted turns. Then ultimately, you also have these that are out of the cup. Uh, the Barbarossa... Uh, chit. You can see it right there. It's like a news headline. And Pearl Harbor. Those are going to happen uh, in basically no, uh, 1941. So in turn four and five, those are going to go off. And you are going to be plunged into having to fight all of these fronts simultaneously. So somewhat the game is scripted for the first five turns, five or six turns. Um, but then you're going to start pulling chits out and doing what they say throughout the rest of the game, and it opens up a little bit. And, and I wanted to point out the scripted nature of the first few turns because it's important to understand that first few turns is pretty much going to be the same almost every game. Your differences might be, oh, you make more rolls than you thought you would make, or you get better income than you thought you would get, or you're able to take out a U-boat from one of the events that you roll. Those things are going to be different. There's always variability in this system. Um, but those first few turns are going to be scripted. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think upon my first play, it didn't bother me. But then the second play, I started to think, okay, the same thing's going to happen over and over again. But then, once again, you get through the first four or five chits, and then all of a sudden you have 23 or 24 left to kind of finish the game out. And those are wildly different. Why? Because you're drawing out these chits randomly from this cup and doing uh, what they say. So real quickly, I want to go over the turn chits and what they mean. I'll use a couple of these green starting ones because they're really, really bad. They, they replicate the first days of World War II in 1939 when... Um, Germany blitzed into Poland and they blitzed into France in 1940 and they knocked those countries out of the war 
and began building up. Then they became friends with Italy. The Italy starts as a neutral power. Then they get Italy into the game. So you have to fight these three powers, these three fronts here. And then all of a sudden Japan will come in the game and it's a free for all. And if you're not ready and you don't do well, uh, you, you're going to, to struggle very quickly. But real quick, let's look at a couple of these chits. And I, I brought one from later in the game. And they are numbered. You'll see there's a 15. This is a number two. This is a number two, uh, one. And I drew those one, two, and three. I literally randomized them and drew them in order, which was kind of funny. But a couple of symbols that are on here. This is the UN symbol, the United Nations symbol. That is one thing that Ben called this the United Nations, the allies rather than the allies. And I'm not, I, I haven't read all the designer notes. I'm sure he has a reason for that but you find a UN symbol almost always in that upper left box on the, on the counter. Then you'll notice uh, over on the right side, there's a South African flag there. There are some uh, letters there. And then there's letters and numbers here, right? A 3A, this one's a BB, a CF, 7A, and a D. Those represent attacks on the fronts. Um, the South African flag represents an event in South Africa where they potentially can flip from being pro-UN to pro-Axis. And you kind of lose that, and that's going to ultimately cause you to have negative DRMs in, on some of the fronts. Not all of them do that, but several of them do. Uh, but back to these chits. So this 3A here, and you do these kind of top to bottom, left to right, you execute them. This says you have three attacks on front A. So once again, German units are gonna be activated over here. And when they start the game, they're going to be uh, fighting kind of a stack of simple units that act as very, very minor speed bumps. They are double-sided. Let me go ahead and flip that one over, make sure I'm um, doing these right. But there are four units that will be stacked in the uh, Western Theater or Western Front. They represent Poland here on the top. Uh, they represent Belgium, Norway, Denmark. On the back there, you can see uh, Denmark, DK. Um, uh, France, this one's France. And they each have different sides, and it will tell you how to set those up. But basically, there's some decision points here. So it's not just random dice rolling. You have to decide. Well, holy crap. I'm having a rough time here, guys. I dropped this stupid counter again. Um, on one side, you've got this uh, Polish unit. It has an attack value of two. And you'll notice there's a dollar symbol in parentheses next to it. So what this means is... If you want this just to act as a minor speed bump and absorb a hit, you don't need to do anything. They are not going to have to roll. The Germans are not going to have to roll as they come into this. It's just going to be removed and flipped to go to the other side. And then you can do the same thing here. You can say, I'm not going to spend a dollar to help them. I'm just going to allow them to be defeated. So why would you, why would you do that? Why might you decide that you're going to spend a dollar. Well, you might spend a dollar because the Germans then have to roll and they have to roll greater than the combat value shown on their chit. So if I paid a buck, the Germans are now going to have to roll and they rolled a six, so it wouldn't have mattered. So I wasted that dollar and it's going to be flipped over anyway. But you can see that number improves to a three. You can pay another buck and they may roll ultimately less than or equal to that number, and therefore it's going to continue to stay there. I'm thinking in my last game, I think it was this unit. I think I used it three or four times in a row, and the Germans rolled ones, twos, and threes, and were able to absorb all the remaining tax that they had, buying me another round to prepare, build up, get some convoys built, and other things. But you're going to ultimately go through this entire stack of units. And you can see this unit here, France, the first French unit, is a four. So you're going to almost always want to pay that buck 
to make Germany have to roll over that. And then that gets really hard when they're on their flip side. You have to pay two bucks, though. That becomes quite expensive. But then Germans only beat it on a roll of a six. So that that is kind of the way it starts out scripted. There are several units that are around the board. Here's one in Finland. You can use that also to stop the Germans in a similar way. Um, they have to roll over that number. You can also flip them back and forth. Uh, try, there's a Norwegian one that I think I got lost out of the game as well. Or maybe that was the Norwegian one. But, but you're going to have those kind of passive defense, but you can ultimately decide to spend your scarce resources to have them be better at defense. So back to those chits. And I showed you uh, two of these different green ones that start the game. And you can see 3A and 7A. So they're in the first, actually, if you look at all three of them, Germany definitely is going to defeat France in that first couple of turns because they're going to have to absorb basically 17 different attacks. And you're not going to have enough money to absorb all of those. But what you want to ultimately do is slow the Germans down, absorbing and taking advantage of these uh, attacks so that ultimately you can survive and not have as many cities move to the low morale area. And then once that front is open, you can start attacking them a lot more when you have turns. But you got to remember, in order to attack units on these fronts, you have to have money. You have a money marker here. Here I had two. I think I decided to bank those and carry them over in my, my final turn. But you might have anywhere from five to nine per round. So you're going to be able to do three, maybe four attacks, rebuild uh, some of your convoys that might ultimately get damaged. Later on in the game, you can make them escorts. So you can flip, flip them over to their escorted side. They're going to roll dice uh, and fight the U-boats. So it becomes harder for the Germans to stop you from getting uh, resources through to bump your money up. One of the things I really enjoy about the game is the economic system. So you'll notice these circles that have dollar symbols in them that are labeled throughout the different areas. There are two, four, five. There are seven of those. And when you have your convoys, and here in this example, I've got four convoys. And I know that there's one U-boat that ultimately is going to be put out because I killed a U-boat last turn, and I think I killed a U-boat uh, the turn before because of rolls on the event charts. But during the economic phase, which is basically uh, right after the, well, the event phase. I'm going to show you this, and then I'm going to go through the, the phase of play. I feel like I'm discombobulated a little bit. But you're going to want to put in, in the ones that give you the most, but you got to remember the more U-boats and the more German Raiders you have, you are going to increase the odds of them actually landing on the more lucrative spots. So if you have one U-boat, only one U-boat, and that would be the case here, I'm going to roll 2d6. I rolled a 7, which is a fairly common roll. Basically, you can see that 6s, 7s, or 8s that U-boat is going to be placed into the number four space, the most rich and lucrative spot for convoys. Um, you can see some of the other numbers only on a roll of two, which doesn't hap happen very often, 2B. So here, you can put it in there, and generally you're going to get that through and not be uh, killed there. You're going to have a lot of the three area rolled, that's uh, worth three dollars. So ultimately, when you have one U-boat, U -boat, you're probably sorry. That's a U-boat. Should have been a U-boat. When you only have one U-boat, you're probably going to put your convoys in like the four, the three, uh, one of the twos up there, and probably one of these other twos. And then you're going to roll that die. And remember, I rolled the four. So what's going to happen potentially there is that convoy might be destroyed. There's a role for that. It's going to then be put into the East Coast convoy box. Uh, or, actually this one's Norwegian, so you put it back up here in Norway. 
And then you have to spend $2 to rebuild that. So that's a, that's a cost sink, but it's a risk reward, right? You're, you're trying to decide, okay, to get the most money, here's what I want to do. You can also play it safe, knowing that most of the rolls are going to be four. I can go ahead and say, I'm going to just put it in a one. And then ultimately you're going to get two plus three is five plus one is six plus two is eight. An eight haul is pretty damn good. You're going to be able to do a lot of things with eight. Now, obviously, it would have been much better if you could have got the four as well. But that's not necessarily going to happen all the time. Now, what I want to point out is that the more U-boats that you have on the board, the harder that is going to be because they're going to end up ultimately being put into two spaces, right? So if you roll the five, they're going to go into space four and three. Once again, the two most lucrative spots. Um, if you have three, you'll notice there's a different, uh, d different way that that's shown. And then if they are in a bracketed number, that's going to create a wolf pack, which will ultimately sink the convoy. That's what I meant by the roll. Um, you're going to roll that. And if you get that bracket, you're going to lose that convoy. So there are options. You got to think it through. You got to be ready, ready and willing to push it, but also kind of use your head and make sure you get the most money um, that you possibly can. That is one phase of the game that I really, truly enjoy. I think it's very well done. It's interesting and unique. I also really enjoy the chip pull mechanic in this because it does create a lot of variability. Yes, the first four or five turns are very scripted, but remember, after that, you're gonna be drawing chits and you're drawing chits from 22 to 24 out of this cup and, and you're going to get a different result all the time. Uh, back to the chits. There also are some special events. This one means that, I can't remember what that one means. I think it means Turkey joins the, the war. I'm, I'm not going to look it up. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. But there are lots of events like that that can happen. You're going to roll dice sometimes. Um, those are going to be a random front that can be attacked, so that's really bad. You'll notice uh, some of these, like A and B gets attacked, C and F gets attacked, and D gets attacked twice. So that's kind of what's gonna happen over the course of the war. Your attack intensity from the axis on the fronts are gonna be high the first four or five turns, and then they're gonna start to get much lessened, where you can deal with them a little more, a little more easily. And, th and that's a very important part of that game. Uh, so that's another thing I like, the economic system. I really enjoy the chit pull, the economic system. I also enjoy the historical elements to this. I think the designers are Ben Madison and Wes Ernie. They really integrated, very similar to what they did or what Ben did in Kaiserkrieg. They integrated a lot of historical elements where you're going to roll on this random table of events. So you'll notice here's the sequence of play. And this, this game is fairly easy to play, but it takes a while. You're going to have to get things down. It's not something that's going to readily jump off the, the table to you. You're going to have to read through these and then refer to the rule book. And the rule book is 20 pages and it is pretty small text, right? It's pretty chock full. One thing I do like is he puts important stuff in blue and red. Blue is typically an example of something Red is something that you really want to remember. Like that's anti-submarine warfare attacks after the Enigma comes out. But you can follow, the great thing about it is you can follow this play aid for the different phases. It, is, it even tells you what part of the rule book you're going to have to refer to for those points in the game. And I really like that. I like the way it's laid out. But you can see it's very involved. There's a chip draw phase. That's where you pull the chits. Turn start, you're going to place the chit, do the events on it, you're going to do the attacks. Then you're going to go to this random event, you're going to roll 2d6, I'm sorry, it's 1d6, what am I, plus the turn number. So if you're on turn number one, you're going to roll a d6, I rolled a 3 plus 1, I'm going to go to event 4, Finland. So you follow that in the rule book, it tells you what happens, Finland's going to uh, revolt and, and turn against you and... Uh, things like that. That happens all the way down. There's a whole bunch of different things. You also get these other political events like area bombing. You can then start, you basically have access to bomber command 
and you can start striking back in one of the phases and bomb, uh, where is that? The United Nations attack phases. But you can do bombing, you can ultimately drop the A-bombs once you have achieved air superiority and developed the A-bomb. Um, but you're gonna follow this through, go through the Axis powers, you do your economic phase, then your attack phase, turning the tide phase, that's when you obtain these pink strategy tiles. And then you're going to be able to, to uh, try to close these fronts. This one's the B front, sorry. You can then close that B front and you don't have to worry about that. When a front is closed and that number is drawn on a chit, you just ignore it. So getting those closed is very important, but it's also very, very challenging. And I have found it kind of follows the kind of the trend of the historical war, you're going to get sometimes the med front first, followed by east front, and then you're going to close out the western front, and, and then you're going to have to take care of Japan, and that's just ultimately the way that it seems to flow. Uh, then you have to do Pacific Naval phase. You're going to draw units, and they can attack, execute Japanese attacks and different things. Um, the industrial phase is very cool. This is where you have to make decisions about your remaining dollars to build partisans. You can ultimately build partisans that stop attacks in uh, basically on the East Front. Very important because those act as extra units. You can also reinforce Malta because Malta is ultimately under siege most of the game until it falls. So you want to try to pump dollars into, the, into there and that represents sending supply, airdrops and things trying to help the defenders hold out. You're also going to add convoys by building them. To build a convoy, it costs two. You can actually upgrade those uh, convoys to escorts. Remember I showed you the back. They can then roll dice when they are attacked and potentially kill those attackers. There's a whole bunch over the hump. There's Rick's place. Over the hump is finishing the Burma Road. Rick's Place is in North Africa, gives you a modifier. Building the A-bomb, uh, undefeated commandos on the board, you're going to have to check for those and then take them out. And then you do your turn in phase, like banking money, uh, canceling military events. You've got this little military event tracker that you're going to place on the events up here as they come up. Uh, India is going to potentially revolt, depending on what's going on over there in the CBI theater and then you do your end of turn, and then you start it all over again. So the game is very well laid out, but it's very intricate, very involved. What I would say is I play with the player aid. I generally play off of the player aid until I am uh, understand what's happening, and then I put the player aid down, and I have to refer to that rule book off of the player aid to better understand how things uh, work. And... and I think the rules are fairly clearly written. I think sometimes I, I end up forgetting things that are supposed to happen, either that should have been for my benefit or to my detriment. That's a part of these games. There's no solo referee here telling me when I've committed a foul or done something wrong. But you'll find that you make a lot of mistakes. One of the other things I wanted to show you, and, and that is also very cool because you can modify the game. On these chits, you'll notice there's a, a circled white Q in the bottom right. Those refer to various advanced rules. You can find them on the White Dog Games website and download them, but they add some extra historical reality to the game. I think deepening its historic narrative, deepening its, deepening its value for historical uh, learning and, and understanding but also adds some new challenges and opportunities to the player. So you can play it five or six times under the base game, and then you can start adding those alternate rules, or hell, you can add those from the get-go. That, that's really up, uh, up to you. But that's kind of the way the game works. I think it's, it's a very good game. If you watched my review of Kaiserkrieg, also from White Dog Games, designed by Ben Madison, it dealt with World War I Europe. Um where you are playing as the central powers trying to hold off the advancing Entente powers. Here, you are playing as the allies trying to destroy um, 
the Axis as they try to destroy you. So I like that he went that route here. I was tired of playing the bad guys or the losers. I wanted to try to help the Allies win. And I said, what, this is my fourth game. I think I've lost two and won once, and it wasn't a huge victory. It was kind of by the skin of my teeth. But that's the cool part of the game. Uh, there's also a lot of chrome in this game, a lot of chrome. Um, you'll notice here there's an allied leadership box. You have to go through a presidential election. Um, it's a die roll. And you can either elect Roosevelt, who's going to give you $2 every turn, very, very valuable. Or as you saw in my last game, Wilkie was elected. I should have put him down there. I think I left him up there. He's only going to give you $1, so it's not as beneficial. That's going to really hurt this playthrough and make it really, really challenging. Another thing is very cool. The U.S. aid to China is marked on this track. I think you started with nine. And during the first few turns, you can spend this aid to do Chinese partisan attacks here in the Chinese theater, the China theater, knocking out these Japanese units um, before they can start building up. You can't do anything against the Navy, but you can take out, I think there's two or three of these that start in here and you can knock them out, which is a, a very important uh, part of the game. You've also got cannon meat, which is basically a, an abstraction of the Soviet manpower. You can spend those to make attacks as the Soviets. That's just throwing meat into the grinder, basically, right? Um, you've also got your actions marker. Your, your actions are tracked uh, by that. And then you, you've got multiple other kind of chromey bits. I'm trying to think where, you know, you've got Malta here. You've got Rick's place here. You've got, um, uh, there were some over, you got the Marines. You've got Spruance leaders. You've got different leaders that can come out. You've got the bombing campaign, you know, Bomber Command, U.S. Air Force, along with Britain. There's, sorry, Bomber Command before. Then the U.S. Air Force comes in and it gets a little bit better. But there's a ton of that kind of stuff. So each game, there's all these little systems that work together that create, I think, an interesting narrative, an interesting play experience, keeping it historically based, but injecting some fun and interesting uh, things into the game. All right, so you've heard me talk about what I liked, and I really do like this game. I, I want to continue playing it, but I, I've i got to do some other games, unfortunately. Let's talk about a couple of the things that I don't like. I already did a little bit. The scripted element bothers me slightly, but now that I've played three or four times, not as much as it did. I just don't want a game to be the same experience every time, but you're only going to have that same experience for the first couple of rounds, and then you you get into some new stuff. I really like this counter tray concept. I'll, I'll move back over here because I showed that to you. This counter tray helps you in setting the game up. It tells you, for instance, here's French Vichy. You've got one French army counter, one Vichy French fleet counter, one Vichy French armies or three of those. You're going to stack these different counters and store them in these boxes and then when they come into the game or they come in as reinforcements or through events, you're going to hunt on this and find it. What I did not like about the game, let me find a good example of that. Some of these counters are double-sided. Eh, eh, I should have. Anyway, some of them are double-sided. And a lot of times, here we go. Here's a good example. So here's the uh, Great Britain Singapore counter. So if you punch these and they're laying all out and you're looking for, you see, oh, there's the Singapore counter. If you don't know that on the back of that is this counter, the New Zealand counter, you're going to be like, oh, where the heck is that counter? I cannot tell you the first time that I set the game up. It took probably 30 minutes because I could not find some of the counters. And then ultimately I had to go through and flip them all over. Oh, there it is. And I moved it out. So... That is something that repeated plays are going to basically rectify as a problem because you're going to understand and remember, oh, that's a double-sided counter. 
I, I didn't like that. I felt like maybe on the setup sheet they should have told you that. Right, where is the setup sheet? Let me open the box. It's in the box. And there is a campaign, and then there's also the, I think it's the 1943 scenario. But here is the setup, these great little setup. You just follow them literally down, top to bottom. Um, here's a 1943 turning point scenario, and here's the 1939 campaign scenario. I did find that there was an error. There was supposed to be an extra U-boat. Uh, I, I didn't write that on there, but in the campaign game setup, I think a U-boat starts uh, in the German U-boat box, and it's not shown uh, as there. The Graf Spey also starts there, but it got removed from an event, which was great. Um, so, so that was a problem. I, I think the setup is very good. I like the counter tray. I don't like having to look for the double-sided counters. I thought that was very bothersome, very tedious, and took a hell of a lot of time. Um, production value, if you know White Dog Games, this is about a $45 game. It comes with a paper board, but nice printing, nice colors. It generally wears very well. I put a plexi over top of mine when I'm not recording because then it's going to protect it and it kind of flattens it out. Uh, but the production's pretty good. Is it great? Probably not great. Uh, I'll, I'll show you an example here. This counter, you know, probably not totally centered, probably needed to be. Here on the left side of this USA to count China counter, you can see a little bit of bleed over from the counter that was next to it. I, I think that's fairly standard, um, and I wish they could solve that. I, I'm not sure how they do. I'm not a printer. Don't understand it. But... Um, those are kind of my quibbles, and I call them quibbles because they do not make this a bad game at all. The scripted thing is a good thing once you get understand it and you know it's going to change. Counter Tray is fantastic to help you organize and set up. Just am bothered by those double-sided, double-printed things. Minor production issues. There were minor uh, issues there with that setup. There was a, a, an errata on that. Um, but other than that, fun game, unique and interesting. And this, I think, is a very, very good stri grand strategic worldwide view of World War II. You've got both, you've got all the theaters, both of the major theaters, the Western European, the East Front. You've got the Pacific Theater. You've then got smaller theaters, Southeast Asia, South Pacific, the Mediterranean. You've got all those represented, so it is everything. And it plays out very grand and very sweeping. There's a lot of unique things that happen. There are events printed on the chart here. They tell you what's going to happen. You do those. You're rolling for events that happen. These military events go off. Just very well done, very fun and interesting. There's some strategy points, though, that you got to remember. Um... Some of that is don't let these fronts build up too quickly. You've got to take care of that. Easier said than done, going to be honest. Be smart about placing your limited convoys. You can't always be greedy and go for the fours, remembering that, once again, on that table, that's the, one of the more common rolled numbers is five, six, sevens, and eights. So don't always go for the biggest. Make a wise decision. But remember, it's die rolling. You can roll two ones and you're going to get four. So you got to you gotta play that. It's kind of risk reward. Really like that. But that's part of the strategy. Don't let these build up. Use the advantages that you have. Partisans, some of these speed bump units. Invest in them. Make sure you're doing those things properly. Take the options of sometimes destroying and hunting down the U-boats. One of the things I really liked about that was you've got a... Sorry, I didn't really talk about this. You've got a, a uh, chip pull cup of U.S. naval, uh, basically, carriers and other ships. When you're hunting down U-boats, you're going to reach in and draw one of those. And you have to have the number that, uh, that matches with it. Oh, I, I match it. I'm going to destroy this U-boat. Then you put it on the next turn track based on that number. So three turns later. And then this goes out of the game, back to the counter tray. And you're going to have to spend money to get that back. That's going to cost $3 to get it back. 
but that that's a very cool part of the game. Once again, risk reward. Really enjoyed that. So there's a lot to like here. I want to keep playing this one. I want to keep diving into it. Uh, but I hope that you enjoyed the video. I hope you go ahead and explore it because I think there's a lot of great stuff here. So thanks for watching. This has been a review of Global War, World War II Worldwide, 1939 to 1945. Designed by Ben Madison and Wes Ernie and published by White Dog Games. Uh, appreciate it. Great little solitaire game. Thanks for watching. I've been Grant for the Player's Aid.